Okay, we might get started. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to today's webinar, The Rise and Rise of Ethical Investing in Australia. My name is Blair Modica. I, I work at a company called BetaShares, and today I, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome Nathan Lim, the Head of Wealth Management Research at Morgan Stanley, to have a discussion about ethical investing in Australia. So ethical investing has seen a significant increase in, in interest in recent years as more people look to align themselves with their values. This increase in demands led to an expansion of ethical investment solutions. So it's more important than ever for investors to look under the hood of their ethical exposure and ensure their option is true to label. This session is going to cover the growth of ethical investing in Australia, investing with an impact, true to label ethical investing, that doesn't really exist, and how investors can build a cost-effective and diversified ethical portfolio. We've designed it to be as interactive as possible. Um, so we'll have a, a short prepared session followed by a, an interactive question and answer time. So before we start, just a, a few housekeeping items. We will record the session and certainly encourage you to go back and listen. It will be available on our website. And please feel free to ask as many questions as possible via the questions tab in, in the go to webinar section. Uh, we'll get to that at the end and certainly looking forward to having a, a good discussion around ethical investing. Before we get started, all information contained in this presentation is general in nature and doesn't constitute personal financial advice. So please see an advisor to discuss in detail if, if you would like more uh, to, to chat about your personal finances. In terms of some, some regular content from BetaShares, I'd encourage you to visit our website. Uh, there's, there's plenty of fun data, uh, blogs and investment information. I'd also encourage you to sign up for the regular insights piece, piece put together by our chief economist, David Bassanais. Uh, it's one of the most widely circulated uh, bits of economic information in the market. And please interact with us on our, our social channels. So certainly Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So uh, I guess in getting started, it's my great pleasure to welcome, as I said before, Nathan Lim, Head of Wealth Management Research at Morgan Stanley. So he's going to begin by taking us through investing with an impact um, so, Nathan, I'd like to welcome you and uh, let's get started. Thanks, Blair, and thanks everyone for having for having me today. Uh, before we go any further, of course, I'm going to do my own disclaimers, and I just refer you to the back pages of my, my slide deck today where I've got a whole series of uh, disclaimers that I'll let you guys read in your own spare time. Uh, let's just go back to the, to the front of the presentation. Um, today, I'm just going to sort of touch on sort of three topics, um, or two topics. So, uh, the first one really is just around the language of responsible investing, and then I'm going to touch on two sort of big myths that are sort of persistent, that they just, they just don't seem to want to go away, and hopefully we can sort of touch on, on those uh, misnomers. But the first one is just around the language of, around responsible investing, and the reason why I do this is because a lot of people throw words around like ethical or sustainable or ESG, like they all mean the same thing, and they clearly they don't. And I think the first thing you always want to do is have some sort of framework that we can discuss this with a bit more detail and conveniently at Morgan Stanley, we actually do have that same sort of framework. And the way that we look at the sort of responsible investing world is we break it into sort of four pillars, restrictive screening, environmental, social, and governance integration, or ESG integration, thematic exposures, and impact investing. So let's take each one in turn. So restrictive screening, now this is most closely associated with ethical investing. It's basically negative screening. It's very black and white. It's simply, I don't want to invest in this, in this particular business or this type of activity. Um, it's kind of where responsible investing started from, if you if you go back in time. And my personal view is that largely we're kind of kind of we're kind of coming back to this way of investing again. The second pillar uh, we 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 classify as ESG integration or environmental, social, and governance integration. Now, what this is is that we're essentially looking at non-financial factors. The idea here is that investment decisions should go beyond just the financials and consider the totality of the firm's circumstances, okay? So as, as a practitioner, one of my favorite things to do is to go into a company's annual report, go to the back pages, and look up the lost time frequency indicator because I kind of want to know how many employees the company killed. Um, the reason for this is that if you have a company that can't even bring, oh, bring home their own staff safely each day, what hope do you have engaging with such a company as a customer or as a supplier? All right, so I think having that sort of information is quite useful. However, one thing I suspect is that 
investors today, they're increasingly just expecting that companies are doing the right thing by their workers and their stakeholders. It's kind of a given now that you should have good labor practices, that you should have good relations with your regulators, because you know what, that is that is important. That's sort of like the, the business as usual, right? I think what's becoming understood by more and more of the market is that companies can only be sustainable if they're profitable and also recognize its impact on all stakeholders in the long term. And I think what we're seeing right now is an evolution in this sort of ESG integration space as investors aren't just looking for companies that are doing the right thing by their investors, but they're also looking for what is that company doing for society? Investors are sort of increasingly drawing that link between factors that are material to corporate performance and also which align with societal goals. And these societal goals are best embodied by the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. So the next level in evaluating the link between ESG factors is, is how do they actually then link to better outcomes for society. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's kind of the way that we're thinking about ESG integration at Morgan Stanley. In the third category, we're talking about thematic investing, and this is really around investors that are looking for specific issues, and they're looking to dive deeper into things like climate change or, or gender diversity. And then, of course, the last category is impact investing. The way I've always sort of described this is this is kind of like philanthropy with hurdles. And you'll notice uh, if you look at the line at the very bottom of the chart going from left to right, we're moving increasingly away from sort of the public markets and more into the private markets. So this is more like private equity uh, it, it, it is the way that we're thinking about it in terms of impact investing. The other way we also think about in, impact investing is that what you're doing here is you're trying to deliver a very specific social or environmental impact, something like financing community housing or, or rural solar projects. So that's kind of the way that we think about it. I hope that this sort of four pillar framework can then allow us to sort of continue the conversation today about how we think about responsible investing. So let's just flip, this, flip the slide now. There's two really big myths with responsible investing. And the first one, of course, is performance, right? Respo investing in a way that's consistent with your values means you're going to have to sacrifice returns. I've heard that time and time again my whole career. Now, what we've got here is the US example. So what we have is the MSCI KLD Social Index that goes back to 1990. And what this index measures is 400 companies that meet high environmental, social, and governance standards. And I think what is coming through pretty clearly on this chart is that there actually is no uh, penalty, and in fact, outperformance against the S&P 500, and yes, this does include dividends. And you can see that over this time, there has been the, the, the MSCI KLD 400 index has actually outperformed on average about half a percent a year, which means that over this period, you've seen about 16% of cumulative alpha for the MSCI KLD versus the S&P 500, okay? So that's, that's, that's the US. But how about Australia? So let's, let's flip the slide now. Well, funny enough, the, the experience in Australia is pretty similar. And so what I like to refer to here are the numbers from RIA, or the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia. They've been putting out a benchmark report now for more than 10 years. And once again, on a three, five, and 10-year basis, whether you're an Australian share fund or an international share fund or a multi-sector growth fund, you have beat your convention, you've beat your peers, and you've beat your benchmark. Now, if you want to squint very, very closely at the chart, you will see that yes, the average responsible international share fund on a one-year basis did underperform its peers. But what I would suggest to you is that if you look at this chart, I'm not really seeing that performance penalty here. And then let's just flip to the next page. Let's just take it even to an even more micro level. So we, we're even seeing this happening with Morgan Stanley Solutions, where we, where when you look at our own responsible investor model portfolio, we launched this back in February 2018, and we're getting the same sort of results. So look, I'm not going to sit here and say to you that responsible investing is always going to win, or it's always going to outperform. But what I can assure you is that investing in a way that is consistent with your values will give you at least market-like returns, okay? So let's flip the page now. We're looking at the second myth. The second, with, the second one is that, well, nobody's really doing this. So what we have here is that we have the numbers 
from the US SIF Foundation. Now they, they put out a report every two years. The last report came out in 2018. Their next report for 2020 is due out in November, so I'm, I'm eagerly anticipating to see what's happening there. But what they've, what they've figured out is that about, if you look at the pool of professionally managed funds in America, about one in four dollars today are already invested in, in a way that is sustainable, all right? And now if you look at the numbers again a little bit more carefully, from 1995, through to 2012, the market was growing at an annualized rate of around 11%. Since 2012, the growth rate has clearly accelerated and is now growing at around 21% a year. Of course, that's fine, that's, that's, that's what's happening in America, but what's happening here in Australia? So if we flip the slide, you can see that since, again, these are the numbers from RIA. Since 2015, you've seen that uh, uh, professionally managed assets have also been growing at around 19% a year, right? Very similar sort of growth rates in America and in Australia, about 37% of professionally managed assets are now managed in some sort of responsible fashion, okay? So look, those are sort of my prepared sort of opening comments. I hope that sort of touches a lot of sort of the preliminary questions that we got ahead of uh, today's presentation. But at this point, I'm happy to open up to, to Q&A. I'll kick off. I'll ask maybe a question that I had um, off the bat, then then get stuck into a couple of my slides, and then and then open it up more broadly to the the Q and A. But I guess we had a discussion just around the exploding interest in in ESG, and and then linking it back to UN SDGs. Um, and, and I guess I, I'd be keen for some of your comments around that. Um, around going down the path of ESG focused investing, but but then understanding the why behind it. Any commentary on that? Uh, well, first of all, I think that's that, that's that's sort of hitting the nail on the head from our perspective. Was that when you're looking at ESG integration, the focus has always been on well on the company itself and just like trying to figure out are they are they operating in a holistic fashion, right? Are they doing right by their suppliers? Are they doing right by their employees? Uh, all these things matter because anybody who runs a business knows that it's not just the profits that matter. It's actually how you got there. And ESG integration, which is sort of like the buzzword today in the industry, is what everyone's focusing on. But I think what's happening amongst investors is that that's kind of a given, right? You kind of expect that a company is just going to do that. And so now people are saying, well, you know what, I'm going to go take it to the next level. I appreciate that this company is doing the right thing, but is this company also operating in a way that's going to deliver benefit to society more than the UN SDGs that I was referring to. The next wave or the next trend that you're going to be seeing is that more and more uh, investors and more and more companies are sort of are, are, are trying to come up with solutions to actually bring that to the fore and bring that and bring that to people's minds. I hope, does that answer your question, Blair? Yeah, look, that, that's, that's very good. Um, and I think it's something that's sort of probably a great way to, to kick off the entry that we're going to have at the end. So what I might do is is run through a couple of my slides, um, just talking, I guess, about we've seen the growing demand for a number of years in the space. Um, it's certainly accelerated this year with the bushfires. We've had corporate missteps. Um, I, I guess more fund manager action with respect to fund managers stepping out of of coal and other fossil fuel producers. Um, and then along came COVID-19, which I think um, has really brought forward a lot of people thinking about these ESG investing ideas and, and wanting to do the right thing by the globe. So at the end of the day, I think that, that's the key point. People want to do the right thing and, and therefore invest in companies that represent those ideals. So what I'm going to do is cover up on the BetaShares philosophy concerning ethical investing. Um, I'll talk about how ethical investments aren't a, compro a compromise on performance and, and then how not all ethical funds are uh, ethical, so to speak, um, or, or created equal. So what is the BetaShares philosophy when it comes to ethical investing? Well, we believe that what is ethical can often be subjective. So investors have differing views in terms of the issues that most concern them. Uh, there's, there's a reliance on traditionally discretionary active management that can be expensive um, and it may lead to uncertainty regarding exposures and inconsistent outcomes depending on the manager in question. 
The Beta Shares Responsible Investment Funds have an element of human oversight through its Responsible Investment Committee. So there is an element of, of human interaction where we can go, right, this all does pass the test on, on paper, but, but what does that look like when, when we actually look at it from a human point of view? And then we engage actively with companies on ethical issues and, and vote in line with the applicable ESG criteria for the funds index. So all of that's really in order to provide as dark a green solution as possible that appeals to many people and many people's different values. And, and often that can be a hard thing to do, as we'll touch on. So if we just go to the next slide, really the demand for responsible investment is growing and, and it's certainly growing at a very fast pace. So since December 2016, the market cap of ethical ETFs in Australia has grown over 764%. So what that looks like at this point in time is, is around about 1.8 billion in funds under management. So if you look at the beta shares suite, FE, HF, there and GBND, that's captured over 15% of, of, of flows into beta shares exchange traded funds already in 2020. And we're, we're now taking around 75% of Australian market share in terms of the ethical ETF category. So we're holding 1.54 billion in assets under management alone across those four funds that I mentioned. And really, we put that down to three key reasons. So Ethical investing doesn't have to be a compromise on performance, and we've certainly seen this over the last few years, and I'll, I'll touch on this more. The second one is we're trying to identify values that resonate with a large amount of people uh, because we understand that what's ethical to one person may be different to someone else. And then we want to provide true to label exposure to companies trying to do the right thing, and that, that really ties into this slide here. Companies currently held in some ESG focused funds, but they're excluded under the beta shares screening criteria. And, and I think that speaks to the, the true to label nature and, and trying to appease and, and, and keep people happy with respect to having a wide ranging value set. So keeping people happy depending on, on their different values. So you'll see here in terms of some of the, the companies that we screen out that, that other funds may not, you'll see her here in terms of fossil fuel, United Utilities, Valero, Marathon Petroleum, I mean, one of the largest oil refiners in the US, um, and Caterpillar, I mean, oil and gas services and, and, and defence equipment. So, you know, that, that they may be seen in some other funds, but certainly through our screening process are screened out. In terms of non-fossil fuel examples, I mean, some really good examples here, G4S runs prisons and detention centres for asylum seekers. Um, Accenture's screened out, uh, they're, they're one of the largest defence contractors in the world. So you can see they're sold and so forth, just some of the companies that may be considered in other funds that, that are screened out quite quickly with, with respect to the beta shares offering. If we go to the next slide, I guess just introducing, and, and you may well be, be familiar with, with some or all of the funds that we have available, but really we've tried to keep our ESG product suite, uh, so to speak, as, as intuitive as possible. So you've got EFI and HF. So EFI is the international component of, of our ESG suite. HF is just currency hedged version. We then have FAIR, which so, uh, focuses solely on Australian securities. And then GBND, which is one of the more recent, uh, I guess, products within the space that we've taken out, which is a, a fixed income component. So if you blend the three together, you really can now start to come to a a fully diversified portfolio of both equities and fixed income within the ESG space. And I'll, I'll touch on EFI and HF first. Um, so they're, they're focusing on 200 of the largest global stocks, excluding Australia, that are climate leaders. And again, I, I mean, the fund's constructed knowing that it's very difficult to keep everyone happy. So a broad base that's going to appeal to most values. You'll see here some of the top 10 underlying exposures. I mean, the top holding Apple, Nvidia, MasterCard and Visa. And you'll see the country allocation skewed towards the United States. But then if we, if we look at the companies and, and where they derive their revenue from, they truly are global companies taking, I guess, revenue from all over the world. So in terms of FE, it comes at a 59 basis point fee, HF 62 basis points. And to talk to the real environmental impact of the fund, if you look at FE's portfolio, it had less than 10% or 8.14% to be exact, be exact, of the carbon footprint of, of its benchmark. It takes $12.29 invested in our fund to have the same carbon output as $1 invested in the benchmark fund. 
and we have third party verification that we don't have any exposure to fossil fuels or coals with our international stock. So the benchmark uh, in, in this case had a 12% exposure. So quickly you can see every stock in the portfolio we can point to and say why they are included from an ESG basis. And how do we come about that? If we go to the next slide, you can see the screening process for, for both ETHI and HF. So I guess really when it boils down to it, the, the stocks need to be 60% more carbon efficient than their peers. We run initial ESG screens by GICS codes, which are basically just the, the sector classification. We rank by market capitalization. We then run a second ESG screen, removing stocks based on business activities, um, and then assess and remove based on negative business practices. And, and that's probably a key part there, those negative screens. So if you're involved in the production or manufacture or sale of fossil fuels, um, gambling, tobacco, junk food, uh, if you've had a human rights issue, you will screen out on that basis. So that's that's the FE and, and HF uh, screening process to where we come to a conclusion on 200 securities that we feel are doing the right thing by the world. Now if we go to the next, uh, I guess, page here, you look at the performance and, and what I'd stress here is whilst we've seen you know, significant outperformance, um, that that isn't really the point we're trying to get across. What, what we're trying to say is you will get market-like returns by investing in an ESG type exposure. So you're not compromising on performance. I think that was something Nathan really highlighted well. Um, so I guess the example here is energy stocks really haven't performed well over the last few years, but you'll see in, in the FE space, technology has, and it's, it's probably overweight technology, which has really led to an outperformance. But over a long period of time, what we really want to drive home is the fact that you're not compromising on performance by having an ESG tilt within your, within your investments. Moving along to the, the BetaShares Australian Sustainability Leaders Fund, FAIR is the ASX ticker code there, and there's 81 securities that are engaged in sustainable activities. So you'll see there some of the companies, Fisher & Paykel, uh, CSL, ResMed, some of those healthcare companies that are, that are doing quite well. Uh, and, and again, that's available for 49 basis points. And if we talk again quickly to the real environmental impact, uh, again, based on analysis undertaken by an external ratings agency, the S&P ASX 300 index weighted average carbon footprint is over 16 times larger than FAIR's portfolio. FAIR had 16.8% exposure to green goods and services, which is four times as much as the exposure in the S&P ASX 300. And FAIR had 0% exposure to companies with direct involvement in fossil fuels, including coal mining and power generation, as well as, the, as, as, well as those with material indirect exposure. So I guess, again, what we're, we're trying to show here is that investing with an ESG framework in mind actually can make a difference in terms of the impact we're having on the planet. Again, if we look at performance, the same story exists with FAIR as well. Uh, there has been that material outperformance, but again, that's not the main story. The main story is the fact that you're not giving up returns by investing in the ESG space. And then finally, what I wanted to touch on, I mentioned earlier, is the, I guess, newest ESG investment from the BetaShares suite, which is GBND, the BetaShares Sustainability Leaders Diversified Bond Fund. So investing in bonds and, and certainly fixed income, that's available again at 49 basis points. And it is a 50-50 split between Australian fixed income and international fixed income. The international fixed income relies heavily on, on the allocation of, of green bonds. And if we, we, we go to the next slide, the, the classification of, of what a green bond is, it is probably pretty important to consider. So green bonds are created uh, to fund projects that have positive environmental and climate benefits. So in terms of the core components of classifying a green bond, one, the use of proceeds. So issuers should report on the use of green bond proceeds for transparency. So that's green projects like climate change mitigation or adapt adaption, uh, natural resource and, and biodiversity conservation and pollution or prevention control. In terms of the process of project evaluation and selection, issuers should closely track their proceeds and have funds audited by an external third party. Disbursement of funds to green or social projects should be made as soon as possible as well. 
Management of proceeds, so issuers should inform investors of the environmental sustainability objectives of their green projects, and then reporting the categories with, with suggested impact metrics include renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable water, wastewater management, these types of things. So that's the definition of or, or core components of a green bond. They weigh heavily with respect to the international component of these funds. In Australia, uh, the, the, the concept of a green, bar, uh, green bond is relatively nascent. Uh, there are a few available on market, but we then revert back to those negative screens like fossil fuels, gambling, tobacco, et cetera, et cetera, which we use for the FE and FAIR funds to come to a conclusion on the Australian component. So just in terms of the performance there, I mean, you see the yield to maturity, 0.75%, you know, generous roll return at this point in time of, of 0.62, and the average credit rating of the bonds, double A. So um, I guess what we're highlighting here is now you can invest in a diversified portfolio of international equities, Australian equities, and fixed income, and, and have a diversified portfolio of ESG screen related securities. So that, that really, is it for me in terms of uh, the, the paper presentation, so to speak, certainly consider investment risk um, and, and just reiterating this is general information only, but I'm really keen to, I guess, open up the discussion with Nathan um, and really would invite you to please, um, oh, and I can see a lot of uh, many questions coming through here, but please, if, if you have questions, uh, give us a couple of minutes just to tally them and, and we'll come back to you and, and, and start a bit of a discussion around the ESG space. So Nathan, I might just put on my webcam now, and I've got you there, fantastic. I'll just bring this over here. Um, and I really, I guess, again, just to kick off the um, the questions, one for you. I mean, I, I, I touched quickly on, I guess, the funds and their, their difference that they've made from, a, I guess, emissions point of view. I mean, how much difference can ethical investing make to the footprint of the world? That's a great question, actually. A lot of people sort of brought that up, that especially with sort of um, ETFs or sort of uh, anything that's buying in the listed market, that you're not actually funding a change. Well, I, I take, I, I take, there's two, the, 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 the approach I take there is that at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to direct capital towards an objective. And you by if a dollar is invested here, it's not invested somewhere else. And I think what happens over time is that it just takes all the oxygen out of the air. And the simple example I like to use is like, let's say a blog, right? Like I can start a blog, anybody can start up a blog. But after a while, if nobody's coming to your site, you know what, those blogs kind of just go away. And when more and more people do it, that becomes more and more the norm. So just like when we're, earlier today, I was talking about ESG integration, I can tell you as early as 10 years ago, you couldn't even have that conversation with a conventional fund manager because they'd, they'd laugh you out the door. Now it's sort of like, oh, what do we need to do? So by, no, by making it normal, that is actually having a huge impact as well. And also just in terms of actually um, directing capital, things like green bonds, I think are quite interesting in the perspective that you're directly funding the development of projects directly. Like you're not actually, like. If, when you actually buy, for example, it's using uh, your green bond, for example, an investor in that is actually funding the construction directly of uh, renewable projects. That's, that's quite exciting from an Australian perspective because as far as we can tell, there's no other way in Australia for a retail investor to be able to gain access to, to such a vehicle. Uh, typically, if you wanted to fund a wind farm, you're gonna have to come up with $100 million and build it yourself. This is actually a very interesting opportunity for Australians. Thanks, Alan. I mean, that, that's, that's really good to hear. In terms of, I guess, defining that a little bit more and, and looking at leadership, I mean, you're, you're talking to companies all the time and their leadership. Have, have you seen a, a shift in the terms of, or, or the leadership and the way they go about wanting to, to make a difference to the world? Is, is there a shift from that, I guess, C-suite that they, they want to make a difference and, a, 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 I guess, a looking more at ESG rather than just the bottom line? Oh, absolutely. As, 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 as I was alluding to earlier, um, it's becoming the norm. Um, so I, I wouldn't really, I, I guess to, to answer that it, 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 it succinctly, the answer is yes. I think more yep. and more people, are, this is just becoming front of mind. Um, I know that with some of our private equity partners, 
they actually uh, appoint part of the C-suite, C-suite a sustainability officer. So this has actually become something that is on the main table, so to speak, yes. Great. I'm just, we're, we're getting a couple of, of questions through just regarding data and certainly how we, we collect that um, and are able to find different data. And, and that can be something that's hard to attain. I mean, do you have any, I guess, inputs uh, or, or any, I guess, points with respect to how you, you guys collect data? I know from the BetaShares point of view, there's plenty of different reports that we can access to come to a conclusion on, on different securities. Now, whether that's the World Baptist Aid behind the barcode report with respect to human rights and I guess screening companies from that point of view. But what are some of the, I guess, data points do you look to? Uh, our primary source is ourselves. Obviously we can go out there and get the data ourselves, but also we partner mm -hmm. with firms like MSCI ESG Research. Uh, they've got a huge database of this sort of information. Unlike financial information where that is sort of like readily available, it's a bit difficult to sort of find a lot of this stuff. but the, the fail safe is that everyone's got Google and that is always a great place to start. Um, that, that, but before you even go there, before you start even getting this information, I think one element, and I, I think I saw this in one of the questions that came through, was this idea of trying to understand what exactly are you investing in. And this gets back to this idea of transparency. If there's one thing that I would like everybody to take away from today's, today's presentation is to really think about if you're struggling with is this is this consistent with my values is this something i want to invest in look at the underlying that's all you got to do open up the portfolio and look how deep go right down to the last security and figure out if every single one of those securities is consistent with your values and that's that is what you you basically answer the question when you're trying to figure out is this right right for me you need to have that level of transparency to go with the information fantastic um, and I guess just again, some of your insights with respect to the longer term macro trends for ESG investing that, that you're aware of and, and where that's going to end up in say 10, 15, 20 years? Um, I think that the, the, the first one of course that comes front to mind is just that evolution towards the, the SDGs. I think that's, that is kind of um, front of mind for me. That's front of mind for a lot, lot of our larger investors as well that they are starting to recognize that they want to put their capital to work with companies that are actually trying to solve broader issues other than they're sustainable, they're good, they're good financial companies, but at the same time, they also want to look for companies that are targeting uh, good social outcomes as well. I think that's, that's probably front of mind for me. The other one as well is this idea of greater transparency. Um, it's as simple as that might sound. In Australia, we kind of lag the rest of the world, especially with managed funds in terms of disclosure. Um, in the rest of the world, you can get holdings level analysis relatively easily, whereas in Australia, it's not really the norm. Now, of course, we encourage all fund managers to always disclose 100% of their holdings. More and more of them are doing that. And once you start doing that, it goes back to that old adage, you, you can't measure something. Uh, so you can't, you can't uh, sorry, you can't uh, judge something unless you can measure it. And the, the way you can measure a fund is just by what they hold. It's interesting you bring that up. We've got a question from William here. Um, do you see social slash ethical investing um, responsibility be becoming uh, mandatory? So I guess mandatory social reporting or accounting disclosure? Um, well, there's a, you already are starting to see accounting standards. So there is the sustainable accounting standards that are, that are starting to emerge. So there are standards that are appearing. But into the broader question of whether it would become mandatory, the way I would answer that is that a lot of the stuff is just best practices, right? Like you would do this anyways, because running your business in a way that deals with your, that, that addresses all stakeholder needs and at the same time being profitable, like why wouldn't you do that, right? So the market will determine that for you because one day you're just going to open up and you're not going to have a business. And another one from Craig that I guess probably plays into the more macro um, ideas that we're talking about. Are you able to share any information about the ESG investment market in Europe and elsewhere? I'm just wondering if you've got any comments on that. I mean, I know from the BetaShares point of view, um, obviously with the FE fund, there is uh, plenty of companies there that we're, we're investing in. And I think traditionally Europe has been um, very big on, on clean energy and these types of companies, but, but certainly if you've got any comment there. Yeah, all, all I would share with you is that Europe has always sort of led the world in terms of responsible investing or sort of that broader sustainable investing. They've been doing it a lot longer. 
they've got a lot more depth, a lot more sophistication, a lot more offerings. Um, in fact, you can probably find um, a, a lot more depth to than what you have it available in Australia. Um, so I, I, I would just suggest that if you want to see what the investment world will look like in 10 years, just look to Europe. Absolutely. Um, and another one coming through, and, and maybe one more for me, but, but happy to get your thoughts as well, Nathan. Is there any concern that the rise of ESG investing will see many fund managers or investors go into a small pool of suitable investments or companies, but, but causing a, a bubble of sorts? And I guess with respect to the, the funds that we have available, you're looking at stocks that are large cap, I mean, you need Mil, almost billion dollars worth of liquidity to be able to be included into the, the portfolio. So from that point of view, you're playing in a large cap space. You shouldn't have any concerns with respect to liquidity or, or a bubble emerging. Um, but I, I don't know, Nathan, do you have any thoughts on, I guess, the growth of ESG and, and in funds management creating any issues going forward? Um, I think that the way I'm going to answer that is that with, with, any, with any investment, whether it is investing in a way uh, along responsible investing principles or following a specific strategy like momentum or um, try, trying to stock pick or, 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 or trying to, try to jump on the latest fad, in a technology fad. If it is not based on fundamentals, if there isn't a basis uh, for doing it, then eventually it will just fizzle out and fall back upon itself. So bringing it back to responsible investing I think what, what separates this from sort of what you can call conventional invention, uh, investing is that it's really dealing with your values. It's, it's dealing with something that's very personal. That's not something that's going to go away. I think people are increasingly wanting to know that their capital is being applied in a way that's consistent with their values, that the things that they believe in not only are being reflected in the choices they make every day, but also in the capital that they have. Uh, I mean, we're, we're certainly seeing that as well. I think um, it's such a diverse range of values and, and really trying to attract people off the basis of that can be difficult. But then if you can, if you can open up a fund to the, the widest range of ESG considerations possible, um, you know, more and more people are going to be happy, which leads into a little bit of a question from Philip Moore for, for the beta share side, but how would I go about understanding the criteria used to build ethical funds? Um, and, and certainly, Philip, if you logged onto our website, we have plenty of information available with respect to the screening process of, um, of ETHI or, or FAIR or, or indeed GBND. Um, so there's plenty of information and, and material available on, on how we come to a determination of what stock goes into the portfolio. So that, that's all available. If you did need any more information, I'd, I'd certainly ask you to get in contact via our socials and, and we can point you in the right direction. And just, just to be fair, just, just to be fair on that one as well, Blair. I just also put a plug in that um, if you go to other providers like Vanguard or or, or Vanek, they would also be providing their details as well in terms of how they construct theirs, and that's that's always a very useful exercise to compare different approaches. Well, absolutely. I think that speaks to the, the beauty of the, the ETF space as well. Very um, transparent in terms of what goes in and out of these funds. And certainly on, on all websites, you will be able to find um, in-depth information into the construction of the portfolio at large. Um, look, some, some more questions coming through. What's the best way to target investing to combat climate change? I mean, we've, we've touched a, a little bit on that, but any, any input there, Nathan? I'm not going to call out products, uh, um, but I think the the way I would be thinking about this is you want to put your capital to where you see an impact, and I think that's where you need to look at individual methodologies and figure out is this dollar flowing into where you expect it to flow. Uh, that's that's all I can really say. Yep. No. Fair enough. Um, I'm, I'm just scrolling through here. There's, there's a heap of questions coming through. Is there any line of sight to a, a clearer industry standard that would allow investors to more easily understand the carbon footprint of investments? Do you think uh, the, the Rio Tinto slash Jukin Gorge incident will influence ESG investments going forward? So I guess not focusing on stock specific examples, but is that is that a, a I guess a consideration going forward. Well, we we already do have a way of measuring carbon, right? There is there are standards out there that actually say that actually determine how you measure your carbon footprint. So there there is there is methodology out there. 
Um, the, the question really now that people are sort of um, sort of combat or sort of dealing with is how far down the supply chain do you want to measure? Now at this point in time, you're measuring sort of your primary emissions, then you're measuring the emissions from your customers, and then now people are starting to go, well, how about if you start measuring the emissions that you didn't emit, right? Like if you use something that's more efficient. So that's kind of, there, there are standards there already. Um, I, I think the way that you need to think about carbon is that you should actually always be benchmarking against something. And so one, one, one way I like looking at carbon is actually finding a common denominator. So whether that be revenue or the size of the business, but to try to put context around the amount of emissions, because you may have a company that has an aggregate, an, a, a, an absolute small amount of emissions, but because of that specific type of activity, it might actually be very carbon intensive. So uh, there, there's, you can actually find quite a lot of material just by simply going on the internet, just looking at carbon measures and carbon intensity, just start, start your search there and you'll be able to figure that out. Uh, just a sort of a broader question around stakeholder management, uh, that hasn't changed. That has always been there. And it doesn't matter that it happened to be an Aboriginal group this time, but that has never, that has never been uh, new, so to speak. This is something that all businesses should always be thinking about. So I, I don't think that's a particularly unique example. Uh, one, one directly for you from, from Michael. Um, Nathan, in your experience, are clients looking at ethical investing as an all-in from a portfolio construction perspective, or is it more like it's allocated as a feel-good bucket? <laughs> um, so when I was back at Australian Ethical, I was, uh, I was fund manager of the year in 2014. That felt really good. Uh, it also felt really good that we, that we, we outperformed the, mark, the conventional market. I, I think that when people have their capital, and this, when I'm talking about capital, I'm not talking about their social capital, but I'm talking about their investment capital, they have an expectation of getting a return. And that is what we try to deliver at Morgan Stanley, and I think that's what the discussion is today, is that you are put, you're putting yourself in a position whereby you can invest in a way that's consistent with your values, but at the same time, um, earn at least a market rate of return. Great. And I mean, another question here, why does an Ethi have more exposure to Europe's leading sustainability companies, talking about solar, hydro? Um, and I guess the commentary I'd have there is just with respect to size of business um, and whether they're privately or publicly listed. I mean, Ethi in general goes for a, a large cap approach. So as these companies build in size, they certainly will be included into the portfolio as long as they tick the boxes on every other, I guess, consideration with respect to ESG. Nathan, I'm, I'm just going through these here. Um, there's a lot of uh, fan questions that, are, that I'll, I'll pass on to you in, uh, in other times um, that, that maybe you can go back on. Um, how do you allow for government policy action or, or inaction, which is a huge bearing on profitability and development of projects? So maybe if we expand that out, uh, can the government government policy be action, oh sorry, can government policy action be doing more to, uh, I guess, increase profitability on, on some of these projects? I, I'm actually, this is kind of, kind of an interesting question because it's come up time and time again. There, there's actually a school of thought out there that sort of supports the idea that governments shouldn't, su shouldn't support renewables at all. And this is not coming from, from coal companies. This is actually coming from sort of the renewable co companies themselves. Because what happens is that, especially with solar, solar doesn't need a subsidy. Right. Like it, it, it boggles my mind right now that if you have a house and you own that house, that you don't have a solar panel on your roof in Australia. Like it just makes simple economic sense to put a solar panel on your roof. You're going to get a payback of three to four years. So the financial incentive to do it is already there. I guess where as a sort of a broad statement where government policy comes into play is more about if there is if there's there needs to be a broader framework of where you're trying to get to. So. Again, this is all this 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 is this is a very hard thing to sort of generalize on. But if you've got a country that is rich in say sun and solar power, you know what? Maybe you should use that. Or if you're a nation that has a lot of um, um, geothermal resources like New Zealand, then maybe that's something you should be supporting as well. But they're trying to fit a square peg into a into a round hole, which unfortunately sometimes government policy can be guilty of, is a, is a bit of a challenge. So I, I guess the way I would sort of phrase this is that. Policy needs to be very careful. I think you need to be looking at it holistically. I think you need to have a broader game plan. And, and sometimes 
some things don't need that help. And I would make the argument that solar and wind today don't really need that subsidy. And in fact, it's a crutch that they should get rid of. Uh, that's really interesting insight. I mean, I probably wouldn't have, have thought to look at it like that. I think uh, there, there's probably a uh, intention from a lot of people to look to the government to to have an all-in solution, but but maybe it's, it's a bit more complicated than that and, and other things can be brought forward by leaving it in, in private practice and, and leaving it alone to, to nurture itself. Yeah. Just, uh, oh, there's, there's a few questions coming through with respect to fund specific examples of, of screening out. And I think the one that, that's coming through in general is Facebook. Um, so I'm happy to address that with respect to, uh, I guess, uh, the investment committee overlay being up with screen out companies I guess reactionary to if something occurs that is outside of the framework we set in place for ESG investing, we can then screen them out entirely. And, and I think the best example there is Facebook. So we saw a couple of years ago with Cambridge Analytica and the data breaches there, the investment committee met and decided that Facebook needed to be screened out of the portfolio. Um, so there is there certainly is that overlay that that there can be action taken to prevent companies doing the wrong thing and, and still being included in the fund. And I think that's an important consideration. Look, for, for all intents and purposes, FE, FAIR and GBND are index-based and, and will track a rules-based uh, systematic um, process. But if, if something did fall through the cracks in the sense that whilst they've been included, something has come about that has um, rendered them unethical, we will take the action to screen out. What do you, uh, another one here, what do you see as the main impact on ethical investing post-COVID? I mean, pretty broad question, but do you have any input there, Nathan? Post-COVID? I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I, I just, I'm just looking at it from just, just putting my sort of conventional hat back on for a yeah. second. Some of the impacts from COVID are clearly that everything's getting digitized um, and it's just happening faster. Um, what we've seen at, as, at a firm level is... Um, especially trends around um, around uh, consumption, around retail, that's just gone even faster down that sort of digital channel. Um, we, we've seen it happening with the way that people work, obviously, and we're all working from home, but we're doing this, we're doing this through, through, uh, through the ether, that technology is just, is just moving faster. Um, and so I think as a sort of a post-COVID comment, I would suggest to you that Technology again, that that growth, that that secular growth that is being driven by um, towards greater digitization in all forms of consumption and all forms of way of doing business, that's just getting faster and faster. I guess on that, and maybe this is just taken as a comment, but is is has COVID been an unexpected conduit of ethical thinking in the sense that whilst it's it's a pandemic and and not necessarily related to ethical investing, it's made us think more about the way we travel, um, the way we interact with each other, and and then has unintended consequences on on ESG and the ESG space going forward. Well. I, I think with any sort of pandemic or any sort of like unfortunate, like any sort of large event like this, is it is that that point that you just touched on about unintended consequences and about the need for holistic analysis and to not to be myopic about about policy or to be myopic about even your, your own choices is that there are consequences to everything you do. So I think as sort of a general statement, I would just I would just sort of suggest that you should always be looking at both sides of any argument before drawing, before making a, a conclusion. There's another interesting point that's been brought up uh, regarding, and again, you may or may not have comments on it, but responsible digitization and what that looks like. Responsible digit. Well, I think first of all, the, the easy one is just privacy, um, making yep. sure that you yourself know what somebody on the internet is taking from you, uh, what information that they're gathering, what information are they using, what are they selling you, and more importantly, your ability to take back that 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 information. So I think that's probably the privacy issue, is probably the big one. Um, whether most people realize it or not, we kind of surrendered our privacy 
about 10 years ago when we all started opening up our own Facebook accounts. That that was basically a, a big surrender to to that to to that. Now again, going back to the unintended consequences that you were sort of alluding to earlier, Blair, is that that's probably something that we all should revisit and go back and say maybe we shouldn't have surrendered our privacy so willingly and easily. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Um, a couple of questions coming through about Tesla and other electric transport companies and, and more with respect to the fund. And what I'd say there, without without having looked at it in, in completeness, the reason it wouldn't be in the fund is probably down to, to free float and, um, and and liquidity. But I, I can look into that and, um, and come back with a, a more broader answer. Um, how do the management fees for Fair and Ethy compare to other ETFs? Certainly very competitive. Um, you look at, I guess, maybe other providers out there that have less of a ESG overlay may come in at, at slightly cheaper, but then you see in performance, um, certainly Ethy and Fair have been the, the number one in both the uh, Australian and international space um, for, for a, quite a period of time. Um, so we, we feel that it's pretty finely balanced with respect to having the most, uh, I guess, approachable and applicable ESG screening process at a fair price. A um, couple of questions coming through about um, uh, starting a more focused climate change fund um, or, or getting, I guess, more uh, in depth with respect to different ESG considerations. Certainly, that's uh, that's on our minds. Um, it, it will come down to demand, and then and then also not just demand from a client point of view, but what's available in the space. I mean, it's all well and good to want to release a, a climate change focused fund that, that relies on solar power but are there enough companies there to, to make it a liquid um, proposition going forward? Hey Blair if I could just sort of jump in there. Uh, I, Please, I think yes. one, just from a practical perspective so this is just me speaking as a practitioner just because something is necessarily good for society like renewable power don't get me wrong I'm very supportive of renewable energy you have to appreciate that any investment has got its own sort of pros and cons. Now, with a typical normal industrial sort of investment, you'd have to deal, you, you, you'd be thinking about sort of the economic cycle. During a recession, they're going to have a hard time. And during a, during the boom times, it'll be great for them. Earnings will be going up. The thing with renewable energy, and this just touches on the point you made earlier, is around uh, around policy. And I've always said that renewable energy investments follow a policy cycle. And you can see this most clearly, for example, in the US previously, where you see the expiration of that production tax credits, that, that old cycle, where leading up to the expiration of that site of that of that credit, you saw a huge surge of activity which led to a boom period and then a bust. So I, I would I would always caution investors that when they're looking at making investments in renewable energy in particular that it'd be part of a broader diversified portfolio because there are specific idiosyncratic factors to investing in that in that particular sector that you need that that brings a lot of risk to a portfolio that you need to smooth out by with, with, with diversification. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, look, it's it's approaching 12 o'clock. I, I certainly am conscious of time. There's there's plenty of questions coming through, and we will endeavour to uh, to answer them offline. Um, I'd also, you know, encourage, as I said before, to please come to us on our social channels if you do have any further questions. Uh, we're we're more than happy to reach out from from that sort of channel, and um and certainly be as vocal as possible. Um, with that in mind, Nathan, I'd like to thank you very, very much for your time. Um, it's certainly been very insightful. I think the discussion's been fantastic um, and, and certainly keen to continue that going forward. Uh, but, but really, thank you very much for your time. A very interesting presentation and, um, you know, thank you very much. No worries. Thanks, Blair. See you. See you later. Thank you.